Hello and welcome. Welcome everybody in the Speakers and Coaches Networking Society. I am Wendy Blum Weiss and I am super excited that we have started this new series, this new live series here in the group, which is part of membership summits that we're going to be hosting every month. And we had our very first summit last week. And you will see the replays going up this Thursday in the group. And they will be there so you'll be able to access them anytime. And this is a continuation today from last week's summit. And we have had guests come on from all around the world, speakers and coaches and creatives and passion driven entrepreneurs from all different countries. We had Austria in the house. We had Africa in the house. We had England in the house. We had Canada in the house. Uh, so today we have the great honor of bringing our next guest on, Folo Daniel, who is joining us from Nigeria. So super excited to have this time. I'm calling them really, it's, it's connections, community, connection, collaboration, and conversation, and a conversation. So I want to invite any of you. I posted just a little while ago, um, Polo Daniel has written 13 books. He actually hopes to have a couple more finished between now and the end of the year. So I just made a post about him so you can link to follow Daniel. It is my intent in the group that we really make these soulful, heart-centered connections and everything that we want and we desire in our business and in our lives is really on the other side of relationships. And that's what we're doing here. We're forming real relationships with amazing, phenomenal people from around the globe. So I think we have Folo Daniel in the house. Welcome. Thank you. It's my pleasure to join you, Wendy. And thank you for all the fantastic job you're doing with connecting all the speakers from around the world. Thank you so much. You're doing a terrific job with that. Well, thank you so much for, for saying that. And back to you, you really have stood out in the group. Uh, you shared a post that really stood out for me, uh, giving acknowledgement to one of your mentors. I, I think you called him the dream maker. And so I'd like- That's correct. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it really stood out to me because we like our, our whole past really are about other people and these these opportunities and we're all sort of seeking like you know uh, especially especially now seeking for new ways to reinvent ourselves so can you share a little bit about that okay so someone spoke to me several years ago and he said you need dream makers and you need way makers and there are quite a number of other relationships that you need. But more importantly, the dream makers and the way makers. You see, the dream maker makes your dream a reality by the kind of contributions that they are making into your life. The way maker is the person who opens doors for you. They are constantly thinking about you. When they have opportunities, they throw it at you. They mention your name to someone who needs your skill. They are talking to someone, maybe someone who is doing an event and you're an event planner, someone is speaking somewhere and maybe needs to go to another place, can't make it to his own engagement. They're saying, oh, why don't you try this person out? So this person knows all your skills, all your abilities, and he's constantly talking to people about you or even giving you his own platforms. So we all need those kind of people in our lives. And that's what that gentleman was and still is to me. He's constantly mentioning my names to everyone that he can possibly mention my name to. And a couple of doors have opened because of that. Well, that doesn't just happen by accident. So he saw something in you that really stood out. 
And mm. do you know what that was? Do you know when mm. that moment happened? <laughs> Okay, two things. He saw my writing skills and he saw the way I communicate passionately when I'm speaking on stage or speaking to a group of people. I'm so passionate about talking when I'm talking and I like to talk about purpose. Uh, I just want everybody around me to discover their purpose, you know, unleash their potentials and stuff like that. But more importantly, because he's in the banking industry, he does a lot of writings and sometimes he's not able to catch up with the loads of writings that he needs to do. And there were moments when I was able to step in. And because I was able to capture his mind, that stood out for him. You know, it's like I just get into his mind when I write certain things for him. And he's wondering, how come you just know exactly what I want to say? So that's what stood out for him. And we've connected ever since. So how do you do that? Are you doing that by asking a lot of questions? Sometimes it's relationships. You know, when we talk a lot, I probably know how you're going to say certain things. If we don't talk a lot, I may not know exactly what you want to say. But at other times, what I need to look at is the, what you're, who you're writing to. If I know the person you're writing to, it makes it easy for me. If I don't know the person that you're writing to, I just need to listen to you have a conversation with you. If I hear a few words that you throw around very often, then I have an idea of how you may want to craft some lines and that, that's, that's easier for me to do. At all the times, it's just about the subject matter. If it's a subject matter that I am very vast in, I'll just throw in my knowledge, then try to embellish it with your own diction or with your own vocabulary. So sometimes it's about the people, other times it's about the subject. What's so interesting these days with uh, social media managers, for example, or content yeah. copywriters to actually yeah. capture the voice of a, of a coach or of a, of a speaker. And there's the question a lot, like who actually does it? Who actually does the writing? So that's a really interesting um, conversation around the, I guess the affinity of the two people together, you and your that's mentor. Correct that you're like-minded. Yes, yes, that's true, that's true. You know, you shared with me, I, everyone these days is reinventing themselves and for speakers and coaches in particular, trying to figure out how to take live events and how to book themselves virtually, figure out the virtual world, um, mm -hmm. going all, you know, pretty much all digital and you have mm -hmm. been able to do that. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things, <laughs> go on, go on, go on. Well, what we're, we're both saying, and one of the things, and one of the things, uh, you, you were mentioning that you were traveling a lot and yes. you know, you've been able to really book yourself mostly virtually. And one of the reasons why you couldn't make it on the summit last week is you were stuck in traffic because you were leaving yes. one event and coming to another. Yeah. True. True. Okay, so one of the ways you get those kind of events is relationships. And it's something we must never joke with. All of us need to build strong relationships with several people. Sometimes some people may not be able to manage multiple relationships. It's okay if you can manage multiple relationships. Look for a few industry-based relationships that can help you progress in any of the industries that you really want to penetrate. If that's what you're going to do, that's fantastic. But at other times, you just, you're just being nice to people, not because you know you're going to need anything from them, not because you know there's something they have to offer. It's just you as the person, not knowing what's going to come out of it. The other thing is you need to be conscious of your image making on social media. I see a lot of people who want to be public speakers. They get on social media. They're not conscious of what they're posting, what they're putting out there. Your content must be deliberate. Your pictures, your posts, your introduction, everything has to be carefully crafted. If you're not careful with those things, you lose the chance. For example, you don't know who's looking out for you and you don't know who's gonna stumble on your images, your intro. So as public speakers, be very deliberate about all that you're posting out. So back to relationships, I get a lot of my trainings, a lot of my speaking engagements, basically from relationships. And once I get the relationship, which is one person offering me his platform, I maximize the platform. I deliver beyond expectations. And that leads to another speaking engagement. 
Well, so can you give us a little insight of how that happens? How do you over deliver to the event planner and actually to the audience? All right. So one of the things that we do in public speaking is to have what we call audience analysis. And the audience analysis is to try and quickly sample the sociocultural background, try and sample their level of literacy, their level of education, what, find out what language connects with these people. Are you going to be speaking above their heads or speaking directly to the people? And let me give you one quick example. For motivational speakers in particular, when you speak about your pains, when you share your stories of pains, you realize that you connect with a lot of people. Why is that? You're speaking to the people from your angle of pain to their own pains. And because you're speaking to their pains from your own angle of pain, it connects, it resonates. And they say to themselves, oh, okay, that means I'm not here alone. And that means I'm not going through this alone. So the other way, because it may not be easy for everybody to do that audience analysis in the few minutes that you have between arrival and getting on stage, what you need to do is to ask a lot of questions from the host before the day of the event. So if you ask a lot of questions and when you get into the event, you look around very well, it's, it's better to arrive early and act like nobody knows you. Just walk through the crowd, listen to them you will understand a bit of their language. So when you get on stage, you know a few words to throw around here and there, and it's going to resonate with the people you're talking to. Yeah. But more importantly, you also prepare very well, or you'd over-deliver through preparation, which is content. Yeah, you made some uh, really important points. Arriving early yes. to get a feel for everybody that's in the audience, maybe even strike up a conver couple conversations and get to know who's True. there ask a True. lot of questions in advance. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned a story I, I found intriguing from someone who has put on a lot of events over the last 10 years, live events, starting to do virtual events, um, around timing that you were actually, you, you were speaking to a group mm -hmm. of, in the banking industry, assume yeah. that bankers are in the banking industry. Mm -hmm. And can you share that, share that story where they gave you a certain time slot Okay. Okay. So uh, this was an event where I traveled from Lagos to another state in Nigeria that is called Oshun State. It's about four hours drive. And imagine driving four hours with the intention to speak for one hour. When, you, when, when I got to the venue, I was told, hey, look, maybe you have to do 30 minutes or 45 minutes because these people are tired. These are senior bankers and some of them are branch managers. And I, I knew so well that the reason they had to shorten my time was because the person who was managing the event was not sure I would deliver. Even though the person who recommended me knew so well that I would deliver. And let me make it even a little bit more interesting. The speaker who came on board before me was one of their staff. And at the end of his presentations, you know what they said to him? He said, why are you telling all of, all of this? We already know this. So you, you didn't say anything interesting. You didn't prepare very well. That's exactly what they said to him. And the two gentlemen who were looking, who were with me, they looked into my eyes and, you know, they started praying for me. <laughs> so I took the microphone and I started talking to them. It was a session about strategy and implementation. So I spoke to them and I told them how their temperament needs to be taken into consideration before you put people in teams. And I ended by talking to the married people on the importance of having sex and how it affects productivity. And I told them, in fact, I asked them a question. I said, do you realize that when you have sex with your spouse and you go to work, you arrive work happy? And have you noticed that when you have sex with your spouse, your communication is better? And most of the people in the room agreed. So when I ended the session at 45 minutes, which was now my reduced time, the boss of the meeting and the manager of the meeting both said to me, wow, that was pretty short. You should have taken more time. And I said in my heart, but you were the one who told me to do just 45 minutes because they weren't sure I would deliver. So when I finished, they said, wow, that was fantastic. We need to invite you to more meetings. And two people, two of the bosses, bought 160 copies of my books. 
in that meeting. Two people paid for 160 copies of my books. Wow. So that is talking about over delivering and leave them wanting more because sometimes we want to give them everything we got in the 45 True. minutes. True. And okay. So the other thing is that's a mistake for speakers. Wow. You can't possibly crash everything into 45 minutes. Once you get to an event, maybe you had two hours before and they say, oh, now you have to do one hour or you had one hour before and they say, now you have to do 30 minutes. What you should do is to pick the nudgets, deliver on the nudgets. And if you're delivering on the nudgets, you will still have said the most important things. So if you don't know how to manage if the possibility of reduced timing, you're going to start fidgeting on stage and you're probably going to mess up your presentation. So maybe before you even go out there, have your full presentation, then have an abridged version, just in case they shorten your time. But for me, I'm always ready. Anytime anybody shortens my time, I know how to quickly adjust. It's, it's, you have to be ready for anything. You have to be ready to be called in early. You have to be ready to expand. You have to be in, and hold more space if someone doesn't, is, is not there. And then also to do the opposite. Um, I want to switch gears with you for a moment and talk okay. about Nigeria. Awesome. Are there, uh, when I, I see you have actually written a book, I, I, I linked it below in the post uh, when I was announcing we were going live. Are there any particular unique practices, business practices that is more customary in Nigeria than other parts of the world? And I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. In China, for example. Okay. Okay. In, in China, um, they, when, they, when they give a business card, I just have, so when you give a business card, you take your two hands and you present the business card. It's done with respect and honor. Then the other person takes the business card. Here in America, the United States, we'll take a business card many times at a network meeting and just pop it in a pocket. You know, nice to meet you, put it in a pocket and go. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the Asian cultures are more take it, acknowledge it, hold mm -hmm. it, look at it speak out the person's name, actually make mm. a deep connection, then mm. honor the card and then place the card away. Mm. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Okay, so let me tell you that I, in, the, in the short time that I have to quickly think about this, the most important thing to a lot of Nigerians is their titles. And you don't want to find out the wrong way especially if you're anchoring an event. When you're addressing people, make sure you address them by their correct titles and make sure that you address them by their appellations, their most correct appellations. I, when I anchor events, take for example, someone is supposed to be doctor or chief doctor and you omit the chief and you simply put doctor, some people will take that personally. Some others are simply doctors. If you accidentally call them Mr., the person takes it personally. Now that happens a lot, but it doesn't mean everyone is like that. So for me, if anybody calls me by any name, I, I'm okay with it. But there are so many other people out there. If you don't call them by doctor, chief, professor, reverend, some of them get angry. And there are some others who just want you to pronounce all their names. So pro pronouncing names correctly for some people is so important, while for a few others, it's not important. And the exposure also counts in this context. So there are quite a number, you know, Nigerians travel to the UK and the US a lot. So there are quite a number of Nigerians who have imbibed the American culture or the British culture, and they don't really care how you address them. They are way older and they're comfortable with you calling them by their first names. You know, I can call you Wendy, but if you're a Nigerian, I can't do that. It would be wrong to call you by your first name because of age differences and stuff like that. So call people by their titles and confirm the correct titles if you're speaking to Nigerians. Even if you're writing a letter, make sure the letter is properly addressed. That's very important to a lot of Nigerians. And anyone who is older or perceived to be older than you, please don't call them by their first names. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting because growing up, it was sir or ma'am or mister. Yeah. 
bit. Yeah. So there's yeah. always, you know, exactly. that honor respect, but it's it's changed here yeah. in in the US quite a yeah. bit. But I agree it's so important. I know I asked and I asked you what how how would you like to be called? <laughs> and I asked you, Fola Daniel, is that yeah. your first name? Is that your middle name? And you said, no, that's, yeah. that's my name together. And it really stands out. Yeah. So it's memorable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that is. Yes, that's, that's correct. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the questions that I asked our speakers last week is to share one of their vulnerabilities. So I'd okay. like to ask you the same. <clears throat> wow. Okay. So I would assume that this is the appropriate story to share and it's about you know getting into the speaking space and the way i had to fight and convince quite a number of people that this is what i need to do or this is what i wanted to do i was much younger i was getting out of the university but you know i discovered myself since i was in high school i was really outspoken i had started writing when i was in high school and everybody just knew this guy was different. I became the senior prefect. I don't know if you have I, I, stuff like that or what you call them, but you know, there were officers, student officers in the school, yes. and I was the most senior officer in the school. We call them senior prefect here. So that gave me the opportunity to speak to over 4,000 students on a daily basis. And I thought it was gonna be easy to just get into the speaking world once I got out of school. Then I realized that it wasn't easy because there were too many gaps between speaking engagements. There were no consistent engagements. So for a very long time, I would be broke. For a very long time, there would be no speaking engagements. And you know, people would seize that moment to try and talk me out of public speaking. Mm -hmm. So I took a job, I took jobs a couple of times just to bridge the financial gap and stuff like that. But I knew so well that taking a job wasn't going to give me that satisfaction. So I kept returning to the speaking until I realized that having a relationship, strategizing, creating a solid plan, and the plan would include how you're going to, you know, recreate your speaking engagements, how you're going to get consistent speaking engagement was very important. So the early years were very painful because of financial gaps and speaking gaps. And you know, I had to fight a lot of people who didn't understand that public speaking could be a career. And I would introduce myself to people as a public speaker. And the next question is, what's that? What does that even mean? Do people call themselves public speakers as, as a full-time job? What do you really do? You better get a job. You don't have a job. And there are people who still have that kind of perception today. Yeah. But it, it's changing. So when I introduce myself today as a public speaker, people are not surprised. Some people are happy. So all, all I'm going to say again to speakers out there is that you may have the similar challenges. There, you have the speaking gaps and then you have the financial gaps. That's one of the reasons I started writing books early enough because I realized that my books would get to places that I may never get to. My book would get into countries that I may never get to. For example, I'm on Amazon, the Kindle store. And so there's a young lady that I'm mentoring who's in Germany. And she first saw my book on Amazon. So we've never met, but she has made the effort to reach out to me. And we've been talking ever since. Someone read my book online and is reaching out to me and I've never been to Germany before. So don't just be a speaker, create products. So now when I go for speaking engagements and they are not virtual speaking engagements, apart from my speaking fee, I'm able to sell books. And the interesting part is that sometimes the, the income from my books will be more than my speaking fee. So you need to find a way. And right now, we, you can even create virtual courses. And that's one of the major things I want to do coming into 2021. So create products so that you're not relying absolutely on your speaking engagements. If there are no speaking engagements, what do you do? You can fall back on your products. And don't just have one product, have several products. You may be passionate about one product, but you'll be surprised that the audience wants another thing. So give them a variety, give them so much to choose from. And apart from just having books, have trainings that you can put online, like online courses and stuff like that. Just make sure you're doing something that generates the income 
from your speaking engagements. Now you can do podcasts and don't ever leave your speaking engagements unrecorded, especially if they are not virtual, because that's what you can also sell to some other groups of people. So yes, my vulnerability in the beginning, it was tough, it was hard. I needed someone to put me through having a structure as a public speaker and being in the right network to keep getting engagements. So that's getting better by the day now. I hope I actually yeah, addressed that as much as you wanted. A lot to write a book, multiple sources of income to think about your income yeah. stream, to have a strategy, yeah. Yeah. to look at where your yeah. gaps are and how you're going to close yes. those gaps. Um, yeah. You really have given us a lot of jewels really through the vulnerabilities, through the difficult times it gets your will. And a lot of people are just figuring that out right now because if they had yeah. one or two sources of income and those in and that yeah. income really has disappeared yeah. this year in some way, shape or form, how yeah. can they recreate yeah. themselves in many different, true. Many different ways? Very true. So, um, yeah, and you shared with us your goal of, of creating yeah. an, on, an online course. Yeah. And that is, that is really, that is why I started the group, the Speakers and Coaches Networking Society. That's why I started this group, because it is about relationships. There have been so many incredible relationships that have formed. You and I have connected in here in the group and, and so much more. And everyone that's listening to you speak right now, it's, it's, it's the vision that I have is that... Yeah. You'll be invited now to speak in Germany, that you'll be invited to speak in South Africa, that everybody- I'm, lo I'm looking yeah. forward to that. Yeah, yeah. Have you, have you been here to the United States? No, I, I wanted to come last year, but I couldn't make it. But I look forward to it in 2021. Okay, okay. Someone, someone heard me speak. I spoke to a group of pastors, about 2,500 pastors. And someone came in all the way from U.S. and was really impressed. And she said, we need to bring you to the U.S. And I'm not sure what happened eventually, but I never heard from the person again. So, uh, yes, I, and I have a few friends in the U.S. too. Some, of the, some people that we went to school together and some people that have been following my works online. So, yes, I'm, I'm hoping that can happen in 2021 as well. And I'll where, make sure to connect with you whenever I come around. Yeah, oh, please do. And where have you where have you found the greatest resource right now? Is there a particular industry in the virtual event space? Okay. When when you say the greatest resource, let, let me be sure I understand what you're saying. Make it a little clearer. Um, I'm glad you asked it that way so that I could clarify. So um online events, uh, yeah. inspirational events, industry specific, like banking, like yeah. the financial world, any yeah. particular industry right now, because there's still a lot of opportunities out there for professional speakers. Okay. Okay, so my, I'm, I'm involved in different industries. For example, I'm also very active in the religious industry and I get to speak a lot in that space. But for that industry, what I'm just doing is almost like pro bono and that gives me a lot of publicity. However, the same people who are in that religious space, some of them are the people in the banking space. So some of them hear the kind of things I share within the religious circles and they say, you are speaking like a consultant. Are you a consultant? then I quickly introduce myself and that opens up a door in the banking industry. So I get the few events from the banking industry that pay far more than what the religious industries can ever pay, but I get more publicity from the religious circles. Okay, so that sometimes really you- it right there. Yeah. That was a light yeah. bulb moment because yeah. one yeah. of the questions I see in the group is, should I do free events? Or only paid yes, I, I do a lot. I do a lot of free speaking. I do a lot of that. I do a lot of that. In fact, there is some, and you know how it works in the religious circles here in Nigeria. You don't get to charge. You just speak for free and they give you whatever they have. However, as you improve on your network, as you improve on your relationship, even within the religious circles, you still meet the kind of people who can afford to pay something that's almost the same as what the corporate world will pay you. 
That makes sense. It's who's in that audience. <laughs> one person needs to hear that message. Yeah. Just one person. Absolutely. That that next person can be your dream maker. Mm -hmm. Really. That next exactly. person your dream exactly. maker. Follow Daniel, thank you so much for being on today. I invite those that have joined us or listened to the replay to mm -hmm. connect to follow Daniel as we're all connecting with each other. Yeah. And yeah. so, yep, we will be doing more of these. We're gonna be hosting the summits every month. Mm -hmm. And from time to time, Good. we'll come on here just like we did today and we'll just do a one-on-one -on -one live stream. So thank you again for being here. My pleasure. And thank you once again for all that you do. I'm so excited. My, my pleasure. <laughs>